Mm. I might be too old for that question because in my life it really changed a lot. Actually, the change from being a purely experimental effort of a few enthusiastic uh, people to uh, a little bit of an industry. So I do see two big waves of changes. One, starting in the early 90s, when the first truly industrial product, the GDC coils, have been introduced into the market, making aneurysm treatment from an experimental technology to a clinical practice. And again, that happened during the 90s. And by the end, in 2001 and 3, the uh, first publication of ISAT, we finally had a, a positive evidence, scientific evidence, that this technology is at least as good and, to some extent, better than the old-fashioned surgical technologies. Now we have a second wave of a huge change, and that relates to ischemic stroke, uh, which again happened in 2000. 15, when the clinical trials regarding the interventional treatment of large vessel occlusion stroke uh, became published. And that generated a much more significant revolution in our job than what we went through in the early 90s. To represent the significance of the changes, the focus of our treatment before the early 2010s has been treatment of aneurysms. The number of ruptured aneurysms in European populations is about 10 per 100,000 population per year. Since we started regularly treating acute ischemic stroke, the number of this is about 300 per 100,000 population per year. Not all of them can be treated endovascularly, and it's a debate how much of them are applicable for endovascular treatment, but let's say this is only 10%, which is probably the most frequently quoted number. It is still a magnitude higher than the number of ruptured aneurysms that we used to treat earlier on. Obviously, it is not physically possible to uh, fulfill all of the needs with properly trained people from one day to another. It takes time, and it certainly generates a certain uh, difficulty or friction because, as you said, the public is very much demanding of filling that gap as fast as possible. That's obviously a very important question. Uh, for personally me, the primary issue is to make sure that we are capable of training uh, enough physicians to do this job at a proper level and with good quality. Financing is a little bit diff diff different issue. Obviously, this is something that governments need to deal with or insurance companies need to deal with. But regarding the cost, the most difficult part is to demonstrate what we all know is true, that on the long term, on the long term this is actually cheaper than having all the, all the costs associated with the long term uh, facilities the long-term care of these capacitated people. Well, uh, actually, what we are organizing right now back in Budapest is the uh, 14th Congress of the World Federation of uh, Interventional and Therapeutic Neuroradiology, WFITN, which is a biannual a global congress that actually moves from one continent to another. This time it's coming to Europe and coming to Budapest. Regarding the training, uh, one of the important issues is that two years ago, back in Australia, we organized a global consensus workshop uh, regarding what kind of training is required for the, tra for the treatment of acute ischemic stroke in order to uh, to respond to the demand that was mentioned earlier on. This year, WFITN, the World Federation of Interventional Therapeutic Neuroradiology, has decided to continue this discussion on a global level. So once again, we will invite all neurointerventional societies to sit down around the table and discuss the requirements from the standards of practice. And that's going to happen again in October in Budapest. 
Other than that, it's going to be a very similar arrangement as the biannual WFITN congresses usually are. So we have four days entirely focused on neurointerventional topics, one and a half day on stroke, another day of uh, uh, arterial venous malformations and different uh, miscellaneous topics, and of course the, the queen of our job how to treat the most complicated aneurysms and this, this will be the last day of the Congress. In the past years, well, uh, as, the, as the technological development is, uh, is speeding up, uh, we have new products coming out, let's say every three months or every half a year as a minimum. And there is a growing, uh, um, let's say, uh, um, cautiousness of the physicians regarding how to use the new products. Obviously, the industry has an interest of pushing a new product as quickly through all the regulatory uh, procedures as fast as possible and then sell them because they need to um, recover the cost that has been used for the development of the new technology. We as physicians, we do need the new technology, so we actually push the industry to develop new technologies, but once it comes, very quickly we become a little bit cautious that why is again a new thing, how is that, and so on and so on, and many times those new technologies are presented to the physicians by um, commercial people who are obviously eager to sell but not necessarily capable to explain why and how this should be used. So I guess it is important to make sure that there is a better balance between industry and medicine. What I'm going to talk about tomorrow is a brand new type of registry that is going to collect a bunch of new technologies, actually all of the new technologies of a certain company that is de developing these new technologies, making sure that every single patient treated with these new technologies are going to be entered into, a, into the same registry. And doing that, in a relatively short period of time, we hope to be able to collect sufficient information that we can provide to the medical community, making sure that everybody fully understands the true value of the new technology and for which pathology should it be used or should not be used. This is called the Inspire Registry, which is going to be organized and sponsored by Medtronic, and this is going to be the topic of my tomorrow's presentation.